but that is quite like that. Um, yeah, thank, thank you for coming, everybody. Um, thank you for you know, sort of thinking that this might be more worthwhile than is, which is probably not true. <laughs> and hello to the familiar faces. Um, yeah, uh, just so you know, um, yeah, I'm, my name's Mark. I'm a development team lead at Gearset, which is a company actually based in Cambridge, but with an office in Belfast. Um, I'm Mark XA on just about everything on the social medias and the dot coms and all that sort of stuff. So if you do want to get, get hold of me at any point, that's where you find me. Um, now I, I, I don't normally put in an about me slide. I normally just get into the content, but since I'm not usually in the cybersecurity arena, I thought I'd best put, put this in just so you know who I am and why the hell I'm talking at this sort of thing. Um, so yeah, the, as I said, I'm a, I'm a development team lead now. The team that I lead in my company is specifically one that works on enterprise stuff and in particular on the security side of things. So on the our back and authentication, no all stuff. That's all stuff that we've been working on. Um, another of the things that I do in my role is I'm actually the primary interface between company and uh, the pen testers we use. Um, so that's what the security side of things I do at the moment. Uh, now I've actually been coding, well, I've been coding since 1970 something, over that bit. Uh, but I <laughs> first was paid to write code in 1987. Um, I'd originally started, as most people in those days did, by looking at games and hacking away at games and getting infinite lives and stuff. I actually, in fact, I started on the mainframe, and then my dad showed me how to edit the basic code and took it from there. Um, when I started my first job, one of the early things that I did was to hack the restaurant and, put, <laughs> and change, change, change the board that they had up to, to show all these delightful things that they had on, on that day. Um, as a minor result of that, after I'd got over the, the initial sanctions, um, I started hacking into DOS. Um, Ended up working on BIOSes and operating systems. Um, probably my peak for that was when I was sent into a customer to work out why their networking wasn't working. Ended up going in, reverse engineering everything, finding a bug in the Windows networking stack, patching that, sending off the information to Microsoft and actually getting essentially my code into a service pack release of Windows. And then after that, I decided I'd peak and went on to just normal web development rubbish. Um, on the, yes, on the community side, I also turn up at InfoSec and I every so often, which is something that everybody here should do because it's great. They get beer and all sorts of things. Um, that's where this talk came from. Basically, we were sitting there and we thought of the title, Advanced Paranoid Developers, so that turned into an abstract and that turned into a talk. Um, I run a couple of meetups of my own on the development and cloud side. And if anybody's been to an IDC, that was me and Phil Weir's idea back, back in the day. Um, I'm still kind of involved in that as well. Anyway, so the talk today, um, highly structured. Um, I'll be doing a bit of general ranting about things, you know, things in general, um, and then I'll just go through a few things largely inspired by things I myself have seen in actual stuff that I've worked on, um, where you know, things have been insecure, um, and then you know, finish up the end with probably a bit more ranting and then you know, could keep, keep it to time. Um, right, so first, first bit, um, if you're a developer, you know, you're obviously, you know, sort of a very happy, gruntled developer. You're just typing away, doing your code, everything's good. Sometimes you might want to do things the easy way. Um, one day, another developer might come along who's a little more disgruntled than you. Or somebody who's not quite as bad at, at, at avoiding phishing attacks as you are. Or just somebody who's been in some way compromised. Um, so, really, when, when you're developing video, the first thing you need to do when you're a developer is to imagine that all the code you're working on is actually open source, that everybody can read it, everybody can work with it. Um, it's so tempting when you're on a closed source code base just to take shortcuts. Um, it, it, it never goes well. 
so, some of them will lie there and be, be missed forever, but eventually the shortcuts will will be bad. Um, and in particular, you know, if, if you one day become a disgruntled developer, you know, you know that those things are in there. You could do something. So try not to take those shortcuts. Um, which leads me on to this, you know, this first one. I, I, I called it GUIDs are not your friend. Um, there are, I've seen far too many cases where it's been assumed that because you can't guess a GUID, that all you need to do is have a GUID in a query string or something, and that endpoint is therefore secure. So nobody won't be able to get it. They'll never know what the GUID is. Um, now, everybody knows that. Now, that's security by obscurity. Very, very bad thing. Um, for the reasons I've explained. Um, also because you may think that's a secret, but are you absolutely sure that none of the other teams is exposing that, that ID somewhere or that particular token that you're using? Um, are you sure that nobody's going to expose it in the future? Um, so essentially, you know, what, 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 what can happen there is, you know, you, you, you can put this thing in, um, it's happened in the real world. You know, some big attacks have been done just because endpoints have been left open where you know, they, they don't actually put authentication on it. The only authentication we've got on there is the fact that you don't know the ID. Um, lots of information has been, been hacked like that. Um, and of course, once you've got those IDs, you know, sort of all, you know, potentially all sorts of places you can serve those. You know, if your API has a swagger endpoint, then people can read through, they can see where, where these IDs go in. Um, and, you know, you could potentially be reading or writing to things that you absolutely shouldn't be allowed to. Um, so, yeah, this, this is, yes, obviously I'm, I'm not going to go into details on any of these things because some of the people are going to be exposing too much. Um, but this, is the sort of thing that can happen if you just rely on obscurity. Um, what was happening here, um, there was an ID that was used to tag an endpoint on a backend. So the application yes, was, was able to talk to a Git server at the backend and get the information from it. Um, what the attacker in this case managed to do was to find an endpoint which he could use to list things, and within that list of things was the ID of the Git server that was being used. Um, second mistake they made here was that things were just obfuscated and encrypted tokens. Um, but the attacker was able to recognize that, I suspect, base 64 was involved in some way along the line. Um, but the attacker was able to then reverse engineer the structure of that token, stick into that token an ID that they'd extracted, reconstruct that token, send it off to, you know, happy smiling administrator who was completely innocent of this, uh, but managed to do some sort of phishing attack to get him to click on an endpoint. Administrator was then authenticated to use that token. And because of the re-engineered token, they were able to actually get off to send that off and divert it to a hacker's, the hacker's machine, which of course had the authentication header for that Git server. And then was able to take the authentication token and actually access the Git repo at the far end. Uh, the consequences you can probably imagine aren't that great. Um, so yeah, just just an example there of yeah, what you can what can happen if you just rely on obscurity and not on proper authentication. Oh, uh, oh by the way, and feel free to wave and shout. We've got plenty of time. So if you have any questions at any point. Right, uh, so yeah, security by obscurity, bad. Um, the next one is in the actual code, how you deal with your security rules. 
happens. Um, it's very easy, particularly as you're building a product out, to end up with something like this. So, you know, you, you know this, is, this is an API with a work website on the front end. Um, your, a, your, 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 web a, your, sorry, your website is going to hit the API. It, there's going to be a whole load of different controllers in there for different endpoints. Behind all those controllers are going to be a load of services. So, you know, it's the base four bits of code that do your, your business logic within your application. And behind that, there's probably some stores as well, so things for fetching different types of objects, whichever database they exist in. Um, you know, this can obviously turn up into, into, into pretty much spaghetti code. And what's, what's very easy to happen is, you know, when you're doing your security checks in here, you're, you're very likely go in at, you know, say, the controller level and just say, okay, is this person an administrator or is this person in this role? And bounce it there. And then further down, you know, you'll have another check which is saying, okay, does this person have the read access to this thing or the write access to this thing? And then further down, you know, in the store, there'll be an, another check you know, to say, okay, this is, you know, at this, this level, you know, which tables do they have access to? Um, if you've got that sprinkled all over the place, it gets really, really difficult to maintain and to follow, and in particular, it gets really difficult to keep your, your paths consistent. So you're never quite sure whether, when you went in through that controller, did you go through the right service method that had the other check in it, and is that then falling through to the right store method which has the other check in it? And you, know, you get all these hierarchical security checks. Um, so what we are really going to be aiming for is to have some sort of central security service. Um, basically, still spaghetti, but tidier and tasty spaghetti. Um, so really what you should have is a single service which takes in an identity and an object and its ID and what you want to do to it and says, you know, can this user do this thing to that thing? Um, if you've got all that in a single service, not only are you not going to have all that sort of hierarchical you know, sort of sum of all the checks things going on, but it becomes a lot easier when you're actually checking through to see what your security rules are and what you're implementing to check that that matches what reality should be, whatever you, what the documentation says it should be. It, you know, it, it becomes a lot easier to read the whole thing. Um, now, in terms of, you know, people, yeah, yeah. Um, it's not exactly a broker, but it's, it's something that you, you, you know, it knows all the rules. Um, and generally speaking, as soon as you know, you know, pro probably at the controller level, because, you know, you know your, your, your controller's been given a request to get or post or put or delete or whatever by somebody who's, you know, been authenticated at that level you know, and what you want to do to it. You know, that, you know, as high as you can put in that check just says that somebody, you know, this person wants to do this to this thing, and you just has got this one line check, which is saying, you know, which is saying, you know, can this person do this? And, you know, and then bounce them rather than having to go through a selection of levels, you know, of, you know, can this person do things? Can they do it to this specific object further down? Is that what, sir? Um, it, 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 it's, an in, it's an availability problem if you're thinking of this as a distributed service. So yes, if you if you are actually having that as a you know, a, a separate service that you call up to and ask those questions of, then yes. But you know, generally speaking, in a web API, it will be just part of the core web API, you know, just run in in the code. Uh, so. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I mean the, the thing about this, you know, 
and in terms of actual attacks, you know, you, you don't actually need an attacker in this situation. Um, you you just end up with code that's inconsistent. Um, what happens is that you know somebody uh, somebody just one of your users will find out that if they try and do something one way, they can't do it, and they find you know, if they try and do it another way, they can. Um, yes, there are certain situations where this has <coughs> actually happened. Um, you know, Cambridge Analytica, when they got all the information out of Facebook, they were essentially going in through a rough, roughly through a back door and sucking out all the information they could because it had been left public on that endpoint, even though if you went through the main web interface, you, you wouldn't have been allowed to see that. Um, and of course, you know, the, the nice thing about this sort of thing is you get lots of reports from people who can't do what they want to do. So but if, if they can do something they weren't supposed to do, they probably won't be. Um, right. Next one. Uh, dependencies. Um, you may you may recognise that. You may even be able to, may not even be able to read it. It's not a great policy to monitor there. But uh, basically, the that is pointing out that that is a diagram of, as it says, all modern digital infrastructure. And the little bit on in, in the bottom right is a project some random person in Nebraska has been thanklessly maintaining since two thousand and three. Um, and yeah. Anybody who's built a system will be fully aware of this. You, you know, particularly if you're using JavaScript, you know, you've got so many dependencies and you know, all your NPM modules all in there, all, all down below. Um, I mean, to be fair, there's only so much you can protect yourself from this, um, really. But you know, if, if somebody compromises you know, the, the, the core of Lodash, then you know, there's, there's trouble going on. Um, but in terms of what you can do about this, um, I'm going to just, you know, I've got a slight split here between packages and libraries. Packages, I'm assuming, are sort of open source, source based things that you're going to pull in. Uh, libraries are things that, you know, usually a commercial entity has built and they're just shipping you a, a module that you can plug into your application. Um, so some best practices here. Um, it's best to Pin the version of your dependencies, your, your packages, exactly so that you know, they're not shifting underneath you and you know what you're doing. Um, use something like Renovate or Dependabot to actually keep an eye on those for you. So, so to monitor your source code, monitor the, what packages you're using, and monitor the latest versions of those to make sure that you know when there's a new version. Um, you can then go and read the release notes for the new version, decide whether it's something that you, you're, you're happy to take or not, and bump it on. Um, but as long as you're doing that, then yes, you should be keeping a relatively recent version of all your packages. And you know, the whole point of Dependbot is to make sure that you, know, you keep up to date and any older versions which get compromised, you don't have. Um, last one is, you know, don't completely forget about packages. You know, dep what Dependbot won't tell you is, well, actually, nobody's looking at, you know, looking after this anymore. So, you know, keep keep an eye on on, on all these, you know, the, you know, the top level ones, and just make sure they, you know, they get they are getting regular updates, and make sure that you're not sitting on something which you know, is no longer being maintained and might might have vulnerabilities that people have found since. Um, in the case of libraries, then yeah, um, yeah, nobody wants to, but do pay for the pay for the package, which allows you to get updates for those depend for, the, for those libraries. Make sure you get the latest one. Um, again, read the release notes. Um, it's also worth in those cases hanging on to the old versions. If you've got a, an open source library, then old versions are available. Um, but if they introduce a security vulnerability and you've chucked away the old, chucked away the old one, it can be a lot harder to sort yourself out. Um, quick example again of something I've seen in this case. Now this, this, this was a, a library rather than a, an open source package. Um, but they, yes, in this particular case, there was an application, um, and it was, Able to spit out PDFs for you as a, you know, to give you a summary of you know, the account status or, or whatever it was. 
else. Um, so what happens is you know the attacker goes in, generates a PDF, looks at the PDF, and in the PDF was embedded the actual in the headers and stuff it was embedded the actual name of the library that had been used to generate it. So they went off, looked to see what the vulnerabilities would be in that, saw what the vulnerabilities were, and then was able to craft a particular input. So you know, they, they, they filled in a text box or whatever in their account status or whatever it was that had been, been generated on, and were able to get that user input into that PDF component and yes, compromise the PDF component. Um, no, in the particular case that I'm thinking of here, they didn't manage to actually do anything too bad because they didn't get it quite right. But what they were able to do was to crash the, the whole system at, at, at will. There's some sort of buffer overflow thing going on. But they were able to, able to break that yes, was, was whenever they wanted just, just by you know, using this one particular bad component. Now, and, and this is why I you know, was mentioning about making sure that it's still maintained. This, in, this particular PDF component was actually one that nobody was maintaining anymore. So, you know, it had been, it had been put in way back when. It had been working fine, but over time the vulnerability had been discovered and there was no patch to it. So they had to take that out and completely recode with a brand new PDF component to stop this thing, uh, to, to stop people from being able to crash, crash their site. Um, next one. Uh, patterns. Now this, uh, what I'm talking about patterns here is when, when you're trying to sanitize something um, so you've got some user input, you're trying to sanitize that, so you want to check that it's something valid for you. Now, there, there, there's a, a regular expression um, to sort of say, right, the only things we're going to allow in, allow in this are sites in my domain, so in my domain dot com. I don't suppose anybody can see a problem with that regular expression? <laughs> yeah. It's not terminated, yes. <laughs> so basically there's no, the, you know, as long as that's found anywhere in the string, yeah, anywhere in the, in, in, in the string you passed in, that would be fine. So what you can actually do is patch uh, 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 that that will that will match anything on the end as well. Um, similar similar things happen if you've just got wild cards, it's particularly when you've got user inputs for, for things. Um, so. You know, it's just very, very difficult if you're relying on patterns to actually get them to match what you, what you want. So, where at all possible, use lists. Um, and ideally, don't do this at all. Actually, have some sort of proper authentication mechanism that you know, allows you to sort of restrict what the back end is. Um, So you know th th this this is a case um, case in point. Um, in this particular application, um, there was I think a, a backup system which would allow you to take your source your, your your company information whatever that was and send it off to a backup service. Um, but what it did to yes, but what it did was to Say okay, we're not going to let it off to just any backup service. We want to shut that down. So we're only going to have it to my yes, ones that we set up with my company name in in the URL. Um, now that was done with a with a wildcard service. You know, so they said you know my company hyphen star dot storage dot com. Um, but what of course that meant is that even though you know sort of that wasn't a public restriction. You know, the attacker in this case knew enough about the company to know that that was the format of their URLs, and they were able to go off to that storage service, set up their own, you know, set up their own instance of it with a name that matched that URL, and then go into the application and say, "Okay, back up my customer data to this location," and they essentially were able to walk off with all, 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 the, all the information you know, from that. 
think that must have been an inside, in fact, it's probably an inside job, but you know, they, were, they were able to extract all the information and stick it out to their own storage service. Um, so yeah, it's, it's amazing how many times I've, I've seen patterns used in that sort of situation for emails and domains and general things like that. So even though it seems obvious, try not to do it. Try not to. Um, okay. The last one is just this is just back to me, me ranting again. This is, this is something that I see far too often as a developer, in, particularly in small companies, but even in large companies sometimes. Production issue happens. You want to find out what the production issue is. So the developer goes and connects to the production database and production server and goes in there and does things. No, don't. Go back to your company and say, yeah, if you're a developer, go back to your company and say, hi, I need to get to the production database because I need to go and look at you know, this table, find out why we're getting slow behavior or why this particular you know, object is, is causing errors. You should not be allowed to do that. Um, for no other reason than, you know, I, I have been that person who has been on a production database and run a tidy up script, a tidy up script and forgotten to highlight the where clause and tidied up the entire table. And that, that feeling when your stomach drops out is <laughs> no fun at all. And yeah, the looks you get while they're trying to find the latest backup and restore everything is also no fun. I think my worst one production was actually wiping an entire hard disk on a, on a machine. Slight difference, yes. You know, you should you, you, know, you should never let anybody near your production database. So it's just in particular, some companies think that developers are these magical people who will always behave, always know exactly what they're doing, and are just the right people to go and look at that production thing. So yeah, it's. It's not a good idea. Um, if you need, if, if you're in a situation where you're having to do that, start working on your log. Start working on ways that you can get enough information out of the system without exposing real data to get what you need. Even if it's a case of actually instrumenting the application retrospectively and deploying a new version to find out what's going on. Don't ever, ever, ever let developers act the production system. I mean, if you've got a, if you've got a good cloud system, then you know you shouldn't ever 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 be letting any human near the production system. The only person, you know, the only thing that should be allowed to touch that should be your DevOps pipeline, which is just there to stuff things, and stuff new versions of stuff in, and it's something or other that you know, backs up pure data to somewhere else, so you know, nobody can get. Uh, but yeah, don't don't let humans at the production, and in particular, don't let the at the production because we're fucking stupid. <laughs> right. um, that was a, a not do that reasonably quickly, but uh, a bit short of the time there. But uh, yeah, so so don't don't ever rely on the fact that your code is safe. Assume that everybody knows just as much about that code base as you do. Make sure that when you're coding, you're thinking about how would I break this thing that I am building. Always, always be thinking that. Um, that's where the paranoia comes in. Just look to, look to your left, look to your right. If you look at your camera if you're working on it. Yeah, look, look at those people around you and think, if they wanted to break into the system, what would they do? And think with that mindset. In particular, don't rely on obscurity. Always have properly authenticated endpoints. Always, sorry, sorry, always have properly authenticated endpoints, and always you know, make sure that you know, if somebody had access to your entire list of database IDs and token encryption mechanism stuff, they still wouldn't be able to put something together that they could use without at least breaking your authentication rules. 
cloud AWS or Azure AD or whatever system. Um, do make sure that you've got a centralized system for your security rules so that basically for your own sanity so that you don't have to stop holding in your head all the possible ways that things can happen and all the ways, all the places that the checks are. It just gets very, very complicated very, very quickly. Um, keep an eye on your dependencies. Um, try to keep them up to date. Try not to let them just die at the end. Don't, don't end up with unmaintained stuff in your system. Um, and do use some, you know, as far as possible, some sort of automated system. Dependabot is the obvious one, but is, is renovating things as well. But something that keeps an eye on it and lets you know and sends you a PR and says, update this, update this, update this, update this. Um, don't use patterns if you're at all possible. And if you are using patterns, be very, 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 very careful about it. Uh, use, use a list. And you know, as I was saying, don't let anyone ever, ever, anywhere near production. Right. So that's it from me. I will take questions. Also, the reason that I'm quite so out of breath and falling over at the moment is that I did the half marathon, uh, half marathon at the weekend. So if anybody's feeling generous and wants to help, 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 help a particularly good charity, then feel free to scan that QR code and probably me a five. Uh, uh, any questions? Yes, that moment. Not letting humans into production in a well-run cloud. Um, yeah, it's like I say, in an ideal situation, the only ways you should be able to get into production are via you know, a human ops person who has great class access to that. So you know, in your, sort of your cloud, you know, you probably have something where you can elevate privileges temporarily and you need two people potentially to actually authorize that. The only other thing that should be allowed in there is, like I say, your DevOps process. So whatever it is that's pushing code out there, it should be allowed in as well. Um, anything else you know, should be done through principles, so service principles. Um, so really just saying, you know, if, if there's a system that needs access to it, it should have its own access, which is in the directory and is it's a thing and it uses that to authenticate for other things. So yeah, just basically no 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 humans apart from that great class option. Everything else should be automated. Any more questions? Okay, in that case, we'll call on. Okay.